I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesofAccounting.com, Chapter 13. And in this module, we will consider the general nature of bonds payable. Bonds payable uh, essentially are borrowings by a company. They issue bonds. They promise to repay later. Uh, the reason for using a bond rather than a note is typically a note is one-to-one. -one. You have one borrower and one lender. With a bond payable, though, a company can split its borrowings up into many divisible units. So you might have a series of $1,000 bonds and any number of investors buy those bonds or essentially loan money to the company. So each individual bond is essentially like a separate note payable, but we look at it as a package or a bond issuance package. Uh, some terminology, the bond indenture specifies the terms of a bond agreement. It'll typically state the, uh, uh, the interest rate, the frequency of payment, and many other things, such as if there's default, what happens? And typically it'll include, for example, the stipulation of a bond trustee, someone who enforces the rights for the bondholders. Uh, that might be an investment company, a law firm, or some other independent party. Uh, another issue is are the bonds secured? A secured bond is one that is not only, not only do you have the promise of the company's repayment, but the repayment is tied to specific assets as a guarantee of that payment. Some particular group of assets is earmarked or designated or assured or secures the payment of the bond. A debenture bond, probably more typical, is one that's simply tied to the general faith and credit of the company. There's no specific security. It's just based on the credit worthiness and the character and integrity of the company. Some bonds have preference in liquidation. Some might be paid off before other bonds. So typically a bond indenture would also go to stipulating the priority of payment should the company experience financial difficulties. To whom and when is interest paid? Once upon a time, not so much now, but there were coupon bonds. They were detachable coupons that could be separated from the bond and periodically remitted to a paying agent such as a bank. Those coupons would be exchanged for cash payments. The company would then fund the coupons by reimbursing the bank. Now, though, most bonds are registered bonds. The ownership is linked to specific individuals. They might only exist in electronic form, as a matter of fact. Ownership records are maintained. Interest checks are distributed, either by actually sending out a check or by electronic funds transfer. A bearer bond would be another type of bond. The owner of the bond is essentially whoever happens to hold the bond. It's uh, the bearer, the custody of the bond stipulates ownership. Again, that's not such a common thing any longer. There's always a question about, well, will there be sufficient funds to pay those bonds at maturity? Some bond indentures stipulate that a company periodically earmark or set aside funds with a separate trust account, essentially, or a sinking fund, to ensure that monies will accumulate and grow and be available to pay bonds at maturity. Serial bonds are those that mature periodically over time. So you might have a large bond issuance, but some of it matures in 2020, and some in 2025, and some in 2030. So a serially maturing bond rather than just a lump sum maturity of all the bonds at a stipulated future date. Some bonds are convertible. They can be converted into shares of stock. They enable the holder to exchange the bond for a predetermined number of shares. If the stock of the company goes up significantly in value, a holder of a bond might do quite well by exchanging a $1,000 face value bond for shares of stock that are worth more than $1,000. A company might issue convertible bonds uh, as a way to lower their borrowing cost. Investors tend to be attracted to convertible bonds where it's likely that conversion might occur. They're willing to accept a much lower periodic interest payment as a result. Callable. This enables a company to, at a specific date and for a predetermined price, have the ability to call back the bond at face value or at some stipulated price, 105% of face value perhaps, something like that. It essentially allows the issuing company to pay off the debt early. Non-redeemable bonds are those that cannot be paid off early. They assure the holder that they're going to get to keep the bond for the full life of the bond. And that can be important if bonds are issued when interest rates are high. Someone might be concerned about if the interest rates drop, the company essentially refinancing their debt are calling back the bonds. So non-redeemable bonds give the investor a little bit of comfort that they're going to be able to lock in a yield for an extended period of time. Other types of bonds, junk bonds, essentially they're high risk bonds. There's perhaps a likelihood they may not be repaid. They involve substantially high rates of interest. They might arise in some type of restructuring or coincident with a very risky business transaction. People might be willing to go out on a limb and, and trying to get that much higher yield or rate of return on a junk bond, but they often also find themselves disappointed that the bonds do go into default. Last, I would like to address non-refundable bonds. Uh, this is very close, but not the same as a non-redeemable bond. 
a non-refundable bond can be paid off earlier, but not by borrowing from another lender. It has to be paid out of corporate funds that are readily available. So it cannot be paid off with the uh, proceeds of a new debt issuance. Uh, sometimes a, an investor might be disappointed. They might buy a non-refundable bond uh, thinking they're buying a non-redeemable bond. But in fact, uh, they do get paid off early on occasion. It's just that they can't be repaid off by issuing other debt in place of those bonds.